hope I've given you some doubt in this calories in, calories in. Al, let's look at the alternative hypothesis. Next slide. In this hypothesis, instead of saying obesity is a sort of energy balance, you say obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation. This is, again, how the Germans and Austrians pre-World War II said, having too much fat is a disorder of having too much fat. It's the simplest possible statement you could make of the problem. And one thing that you should be always taught in science is start with the simplest possible statement. You don't want any statement of the problem that might have assumptions woven into it like obesity is a sort of energy balance or overeating. So having too much fat is a sort of having too much fat. And the first question a doctor should ask himself is, gee, I wonder what regulates fat tissue? Because this person's got too much of it, and we're going to get to that. OK, overeating and inactivity are compensatory effects. They're not causes. So by that, I mean something makes us fatter. And what the laws of thermodynamics tell us, if we get fatter, you have to either eat more or expend less, because you have to be in energy imbalance. We don't get fat because we overeat. We overeat because our fat tissue is accumulating excess fat. Next slide. So to show you this isn't a rhetorical game, this is a me metaphor that the uh, Europeans use, although without this extraordinary cute child. Um, 2006, he was one year old. He weighed 20 pounds. And three years later, he had gained 45 pounds. And he had grown, OK? Gained 20. So 25 pounds, he had to overeat. He had to take in more energy than he expended. But he didn't grow because he overate, right? I mean, he overate because he was growing, obviously. And the growth is caused by growth hormone, which then stimulates insulin-like growth factor, and all these things happen. But the overeating is an effect of growth. Next slide. That's always the case in nature. That's the weird thing about this. Like, here's a cancer cell, particularly grotesque example. Here's a tumor that's getting larger. That tumor is taking in more energy than it expends. OK, it's overeating if you want to look at that. But we don't care. If you're an you know, oncologist or a cancer researcher at Stanford, UCSF, you don't care that it's taking in more calories than expense. That's obvious. It's growing. I mean, and, and the fact is you can starve it to death by cutting off its energy flow, which is a good thing. But you can also stunt a child's growth by cutting off its energy flow. That still doesn't tell you anything about what's making it grow. OK, why is it taking in all these calories? What's driving it to grow? And we know that there are all kinds of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes and effects that have you know, gone mutations in the DNA that are driving this thing to grow. And as it does, it has to take in more calories and expense. The fact that it does is irrelevant. Next slide. OK, this is a theory of obesity called the lipophilia hypothesis. It was a German-Austrian hypothesis prior to World War II. The two major proponents were Gustav von Bergmann, who was a major figure in internal medicine in Germany in the first half of the 20th century. Today, the German Society for Internal Medicine, their highest award is the Gustav von Bergmann Award. He's no quack. And Julius Bauer, who was a professor of genetics and endocrinology, the science of hormones at the University of Vienna, a very famous guy when he came to New York and lectured. It would be written up in the New York Times. By 1940, it was more or less fully accepted. Okay, the problem is that 1940 was a very bad year for Europe. Okay, and after the war, nobody cared about what the Germans or Austrians had to say about anything. Actually, that's not true. In physics, where I grew up, the physicists used to say the best thing that ever happened to American science was Hitler, because he drove all these brilliant Europeans to the U.S. and with them this culture of science. But in Germany, and uh, you know, in medicine and public health. These people were driven out of Europe. Bauer came over in 1938 when the Nazis invaded Austria. And they ended up working in third-rate hospitals. And if they got articles published, they were without any um, affiliations. Bauer would publish articles that would say, Julius Bauer, Hollywood, California. He was actually working for the Seventh-day Adventist Hospital in Hollywood, although his son went on to become dean of USC Medical School. So what's the hypothesis? The idea, lipophilia means love of fat. And the idea is some tissue loves to expand with fat and other tissue don't. And the metaphor they used was the hair growth. It's like just as we grow hair in some place, but not others, we get fat in some place, not others. We don't get fat in our foreheads, usually, or the back of our hands, but we all know where we do get fat. And just as some people are hairier than others, some people are fatter than others, and this is all controlled by various hormones and enzymes and nervous system effects. Next slide. This is how Bauer put it in 1929. He said, like a malignant tumor like the fetus, the uterus or the breast of a pregnant woman, the abnormal lipophilic tissue seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition. Okay, so we can already begin to see how those Trinidadians and 
all those populations with obese mothers and malnourished children, you can get fat even in the case of undernutrition. It maintains its stock and may increase it independent of the requirements of the organism. A sort of anarchy exists. The adipose tissue lives for itself and does not fit into the precisely regulated management of the whole organism. It's like a tumor. If it wants to expand, it's going to do it. And the question is, why does it want to expand? Next slide. Okay, you could look at animal models of obesity. Um, there are dozens of them, and you could simply ask the question. There, you could do surgical interventions that make animals get obese, or genetic interventions, or breeds of animals that grow obese. Um, you could give them certain diets to make them obese. And the question you always ask yourself is simple. Will the animal get obese even if I don't let it eat anymore? Because if it does, what I've done to that animal is not like if I uh, lesion its ventromedial hypothalamus. I haven't caused it to eat more. I've caused its fat tissue to become lipophilic. Jean Mayer, the leading uh, nutritionist in the United States in 1968, put it this way. He was studying a breed of obese mice. He said, these mice will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starve. Okay? They don't get fat because they overeat. They get fat if they eat at all. In fact, there's a type of uh, rat called a zucker rat that's obese. Uh, and you can take these zucker rats, you take them from their mothers at 21 days when they're done weaning. And then you can put half of them on a calorie-restricted diet and let half of them eat as much as you want. These are experiments that were done at UC Santa Cruz in the late 70s. And the ones on the calorie-restricted diets will get fatter than the ones that get to eat as much as they want. They won't weigh more, but they will have more fat tissue, and they'll have smaller organs, and their brains will be smaller, as though their drive to accumulate fat in their fat tissue is so great that they will cannibalize their brains and organs to do it. It's got nothing to do about how much they eat. They get fatter if they eat less than if they eat more. Next slide. Okay, so here's the question. Why vertical growth but not... Horizontal. I mean, if, if, you know, for a child, growth is the cause, overeating is the effect. In animals, growth is always the cause, overeating is the effect. Why not man? And if obesity is sort of excess fat accumulation, what regulates fat accumulation, okay? Okay, here's my five-minute lecture on everything you have to know about fat accumulation. Lesson number one, triglycerides and fatty acids. I'll talk like a professor now. Okay, fat is stored as triglycerides. Um, this is a triglyceride, okay? It's a fatty acid, three fatty acids joined together by a glycerol molecule. So we store fat as triglycerides and we burn fatty acids for fuel. And fat enters and exits the fat cells as fatty acids. And inside the fat cells, fatty acids continually cycle into triglycerides and back out again. Next slide. So here's the deal. Here are the fatty acids. They actually get to your... Um, fat cell, here's a fat cell, here's the fatty acids. They come in, lipo, in lipoproteins, like uh, you know, the, the good and bad lipo, LDL and H, LDL. So there's an enzyme here that breaks the uh, triglycerides and the lipoproteins down into fatty acids. The fatty acids pass through the cell membrane, and the reason they do it is because they're small enough to do it. Okay? And then inside the fat cell, they get bonded with a glycerol molecule into a triglyceride. And when the fat is into a triglyceride in your fat cell, it's stuck there because it's too big to get out. It's like if you've ever bought a piece of furniture and you bring it home and you find it's too big to get into the room that you bought it for, so you have to take it apart and move it across in pieces and put it back together again. That's what we do. We break down the fatty acids, they pass through the cell membrane, then we form them into triglycerides, and then inside the fat cell they get broken down again into fatty acids and they can flow out. And here's where that energy balance stuff is crucial. I mean, it's absurdly simple. We get fatter if more fatty acids pass into the fat cell than leave it, okay? So anything that works to bring fatty acids into the fat cell works to make us fatter. Anything that works to form fatty acids into triglycerides works to make us fatter. And anything that works to break down triglycerides into the component fatty acids and move them out works to make us leaner. And you want to know what controls all that. That's sort of the simplest possible image. Next slide. Here's a more complicated version. Hormonal regulation of fat cells. And we're just asking the question, what is it that controls fat storage, putting fat in, and fat mobilization, getting these fatty acids out? This is from a 2010 textbook. But it was known since the early 1960s. Insulin, the hormone insulin, is the primary regulator of fat metabolism. Okay, that was Rosalind Yallow and Solomon Burson who invented the technology necessary 
to learn this. So the Germans, Austrians had this hypothesis. They vanished in 1940. It's not until 1959-60 that Yalow and Burson published a technology for measuring hormones in the blood. And by the early 60s, we know that insulin regulates fat metabolism. You could see in this diagram fat storage from a 2010 textbook. Basically, it's insulin, 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 insulin. And fat mobilization, insulin suppresses it. Other hormones actually work to get fat out of your fat tissue because they want to make fuel available for you to do whatever they're telling you to do. Next slide. Okay, here's just, this is suppression of fat mobilization, getting the fatty acids out, and again, it's insulin, insulin, insulin. Release of fatty acids from fat cells, quote, requires only the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. That's how Yalow and Burson put it 46 years ago. Next slide. So the fact that insulin increases the formation of fat, this is a quote, best is the best who invented, who discovered insulin in 1921 with a fellow named Banting and won the Nobel Prize for it. The fact that insulin increased the formation of fat has been obvious ever since the first emaciated dog or diabetic patient demonstrated a fine pad of adipose tissue made as a result of treatment with the hormone. Next slide. Here's a graphic illustration. Okay, the overall action of insulin on the adipocyte, that's a fat cell. This is from a 2001 endocrinology textbook that you could get off the Library of Medicine website. I had to pay $1,500 to use this photo. It's a great one. Okay, the action of insulin on the adipocyte is to stimulate fat storage and inhibit fat mobilization. The remarkable effects of locally injected insulin on the accumulation of fat into fat cells are graphically illustrated here. This is a woman who was 17 years old, 1947, when she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And for the next 50 years, she gave herself insulin shots on the same two spots in her thighs. And she ended up with these huge fat masses. Because that's what insulin does. It tells fat tissue to hold on to fat. So what she did to her thighs, we've been doing to our country. Next slide. Okay, so here's the bottom line. When insulin is secreted or chronically elevated, fat accumulates in the fat tissue. And when insulin levels drop, fat escapes from the fat tissue and the fat depots drain, shrink. And we secrete insulin primarily in response to the carbohydrates in our diet, okay? In 19... 65, after this 10-year period of discovery on the mechanism of the regulation of fat tissue, the American College uh, Physiological Society published a 500-page handbook of fat metabolism that was co-edited by this fellow, George Cahill, who was at Harvard. He went on to become science director of the, the, uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, very famous guy. And the message of this book, as Cahill put it to me, was carbohydrate is driving insulin is driving fat, okay? Very simple statement, and you could remove is driving insulin, and you end up with carbohydrate is driving fat, the logical equivalent. By the way, Cahill said this. He actually believes people get fat because they're sedentary. But this is what the science of fat regulation tells you. Next slide. Okay? Not all carbohydrates, okay? The more insulin they stimulate, the more fattening they'll be. So there's this whole group of carbohydrates that happen to be the base of the food guide pyramid, what we've all been told to eat for the past 40 years. Bread, cereal, rice, and pasta, they're called high glycemic index carbs. They stimulate a lot of insulin secretion. They are particularly fattening. Next slide. And sugar. This is a photo they used on the cover of my New York Times Magazine article. By sugars, I mean both sucrose, the white stuff we put on our coffee and tea, and high fructose corn syrup. They're effectively identical. These are half fructose, and the fructose is metabolized mostly by the liver, and it probably causes a condition called insulin resistance. When you're insulin resistant, your body is taking calories from your muscle and putting them in your fat. It changes how you partition fuel. Next slide. Question, should this be surprising? Okay. Um, until 1965, about 150 years, century and a half, the conventional wisdom was that carbohydrates make you fat. That's what my mother grew up believing. Okay, this British Journal of Nutrition, 1963, the very first sentence written by one of the two leading dietitians in England, every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. This is a piece of common knowledge which few nutritionists would dispute. Dr. Spock's Baby and Child Care, six editions, 1946 to 92, all had this sentence. The amount of plain starchy foods, cereals, breads, potatoes taken is what determines in the case of most people how much weight they gain or lose. Next paragraph. If you went to a hospital in the 1940s and 1950s and you were obese, 
This is the kind of diet you would be treated with. This was true at Harvard Medical School, Stanford Medical School, Cornell Medical School. Um, this is from the Practice of Endocrinology, a British textbook written by Raymond Green, who's the brother of Graham Green. Foods to be avoided, bread and everything else made with flour, cereals including breakfast cereals, potatoes and all other white root vegetables, foods containing much sugar, all sweets. You can eat as much as you like of the following foods, meat, fish, birds, all green vegetables, eggs, dried or fresh, cheese, fruit except bananas and grapes. This is the base of the food guide pyramid, right? <laughs> and the reason, they, Green didn't know this because we hadn't worked out the insulin stuff, the reason you avoid these foods is because they are literally fattening. And the reason you could eat as much as you want of those is because they're literally not. It's that simple. Some foods make you fat, other foods don't. Okay, there is this concept called fattening and it's basically determined by the response on insulin. Next slide. Okay, so here's the conclusions. This is a biological problem, not a physical problem. Obesity is sort of fat accumulation, not energy balance, not overeating, not sedentary behavior. Fat accumulation is regulated fundamentally by insulin and dietary carbohydrates, okay? Carbohydrate is driving insulin, is driving fat. And the only non-pharmaceutical remedy is to restrict, to remove the causative agent, the carbohydrates. So if you're a doctor and your patient comes in and he's smoking, and you don't want him to get lung cancer, you don't put him on like a smoking cessation diet or anything like that, you say quit. Or at least smoke less. And what I'm arguing is that carbohydrates, these are the, literally the cause of obesity. Not all of them. I mean, green leafy vegetables, salad greens, they have a lot of fiber. They have very low carbohydrate, digestible carbohydrate content. You digest them slowly. They're fine. The high GI carbs, the starches, the base of the food guide pyramid, basically, and the sweets are what make people fat. Next slide. So the question is, you could ask, where did this science go? Crucial thing. I mean, what I'm saying is the obesity epidemic was solved in the 1960s. Okay, everything should have been a great triumph of medical science. What every woman knows was worked out in the laboratory and it was demonstrated why they knew that, why it was right. But what happened was we decided, and you can actually I document this in good calories, bad calories. In the 1970s, the science of fat metabolism was deemed to be irrelevant to a disorder of excess fat accumulation. Okay, it was slowly weaned out and it all became about calories and when you think it's all about calories, you don't care about fat accumulation. If your trainer or your doctor says eat less, exercise more, they don't care about how this is. Carbohydrates make fat cells fat. What makes people fat? To a first approximation, obesity is a result of taking in more calories in the diet than are expended by the body's energy consuming activities. An entirely different mechanism. So your fat cells get fat because of the carbs and you get fat because you eat too much. Next slide, or you don't exercise. The other thing that happens, in the 1960s, we began to believe that dietary fat causes heart disease. The American Heart Association started pushing this idea in 1961 when there were zero studies to support it, okay? And they got more and more zealous. The more and more they did studies, it showed that they were, you couldn't demonstrate that saturated fat causes heart disease. But if you're going to tell someone to eat a carbohydrate-poor diet, a, to restrict carbohydrates, you replace the carbohydrates with fat. Diet is a trade-off. Protein levels stay pretty much constant. You don't even want to increase protein, as you'll hear from Peter Atia shortly. So you get rid of the carbs and you replace it with fat. And now you're eating a high-fat diet. And remember, in the 1960s, the American Heart Association is telling people that dietary fat causes heart disease. So in 1965, the very same year that the American Physiological Society comes out with this 500-page handbook of science saying carbohydrates drive insulin, drive fat, the New York Times has an article that says, new diet decried by nutritionists, dangers are seen in low carbohydrate intake, and it starts, some of the nation's top nutrition experts are concerned at the popularity of the low carbohydrate reducing diet, which one of them calls nonsense. Nonsense because you tell obese people they could eat as much as they want, they don't have to exercise, okay, therefore, you know, it it's, it's, uh, 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 refutes the laws of thermodynamics. And another compares to mass murder. That was Jean Maillier, the leading nutritionist, because you're telling them to eat high-fat diets. So we know the science implicates carbohydrates and obesity, but if you tell your patients to eat less carbs, you're doing the equivalent of mass murder. Next slide. Okay, so what happens? By the 1980s, the Fattening carbohydrate has become the heart-healthy carbohydrate as diet food. 
and we're told we can eat as much of it or should eat of it as much as possible. All those foods that you restricted in the 1940s and 1950s, if you went into a hospital that were obese, became the disease that were foods that we ate every day. The baked potato in the 1960s, fattening in the 1980s, it's a diet food. Remember, we were all eating baked potatoes. We just weren't putting butter and sour cream on them. Sugar, even though it's up here, gets a free pass because there's no fat in it. And by the 1990s, the American Heart Association, actually I have a pamphlet where they're telling people to replace the fatty snacks in their diet with sugar or candy that doesn't have fat in it. Next slide. Okay, so why were these people fat, populations fat? I asked that question earlier. The answer is most third world countries have a high carbohydrate intake as their economic dependence is predominantly agricultural with a heavy dependence on non-dairy produces. This is Ralph Richards in 73. It's conceivable that the ready availability of starch in preference to animal protein contributing to must the main caloric requirements leads to increased lipogenesis. That means fat formation. It didn't say leads to increased hunger. Lipogenesis and the development of obesity. I think I might have one more slide that I want to show you guys and then I'll go away and let Peter talk. One of the interesting, the arguments I'm making is carbohydrates are literally fattening. They literally make you fat, some more so than others, and different people were, um, are more um, susceptible to this than others. Lean people can eat carbs. It's very unfair. Your lean sister or brother can eat as much pasta as they want. You can't. Just like some people, um, if you look at cigarettes as a metaphor, uh, we know cigarettes cause lung cancer, but only about one in ten smokers will get it. The fact that 90% of them don't doesn't mean that for 90% of them who do, cigarettes were the cause. I'm making the same argument about carbohydrates. So then when you look at diet studies, and when you look at diet studies, you always find that the diets that restrict carbohydrates do the best. Okay? And this was a study um, that was done in Israel a few years ago. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the point is, if a diet works, you often hear, well, low carb works for some people, low fat works for others. That's sort of the compromise position now. But what you'll see, here's a low fat diet against the Mediterranean diet against a low carbohydrate diet, okay? The low fat diet is calorie restricted. The low carbohydrate diet isn't, which means here you're told to eat about 1,400 calories a day, basically lettuce, skinless chicken breast, a little rice. Here you're told you could eat as much as you want, you know, eggs, bacon, sausage, prime ribs, ribeyes, roast chickens, go crazy. What you'll find is even the low-fat diet, if you look at energy change over 24 months, this diet, they eat about 600 calories less. But here's carbohydrates. They eat about 330 calories less of carbohydrates and 170 calories less of fat. So the low-fat diet restricts carbohydrates twice as much as it restricts fat, okay? And the argument I'm making is the reason it doesn't work as well is because it restricts other things other than the carbohydrates. It does restrict fat, and it doesn't restrict calorie carbohydrates as much or enough. The other thing that happens in these diet studies is even if you go on a low-fat diet, you're going to give up a lot of things that you think of as evil and high in calories. So you'll give up Coca-Cola and drink Diet Coke. And you may think of it as a way to cut calories, but you're cutting sugar. You know, you give up beer and drink light beer. You give up um, the white bread and you switch to brown bread. You don't eat white rice, you switch to brown bread. So you improve the quality of the carbohydrates you're eating. And then you lose a little weight and you think it's because I cut calories and cut fat. You get rid of desserts thinking they're full of fat but you're cutting all the sugar in the desserts. And then what argument that I'm making is the reason you're losing weight is because you're cutting carbs and cutting sugar and improving the glycemic index of the carbs you do eat. But the reason you're not losing enough weight and the reason you're not having so much trouble keeping it off and you're so hungry all the time is because you're actually doing, you're getting a little bit of the, inter, the correct intervention when you could get the whole correct in, intervention. The problem with the whole correct intervention is it smacks of Atkins in fact, it was Atkins. Atkins was right. That's what I'm arguing. He just read the same literature I did. And all this nonsense we've gotten since then about avoiding fat, especially for women, there has never been a study ever done that has shown a benefit for women to lower their fat intake. Men, maybe. Women, not one. Okay? I mean, if anyone should be enjoying butter and full-fat sour cream and cream in your coffee, it's you guys. 
Okay, one way or the other, even if I'm wrong about everything else, there has never been a study done showing that women benefit from eating less fat. You've just gotten thrown in with the men because it seemed like the right thing to do. Okay, anyway, I want to thank you. I'm going to sit down. Now we're going to hear Peter describe basically sort of how he took what I said and did this unbelievable thing. And then anyone else can do, although they have to be a little bit. <laughs> thank you very much.